when we talk about soundstage, we talk about a plethora of things, but two of those things in particular are focus and imaging. So let's talk about imaging first. Imaging is what happens when you place an object in the soundstage. Now these are baked into the recording. You can't really do anything about what's already on the recording, but I'm just kind of giving you a general example when I say, let's talk about a singer who is in the center of the soundstage and maybe you have a drum on the left and a guitar on the right. Imaging would be, is that singer in the center? Is that drum on the left? And is that guitar on the right? That's imaging. Focus is how tight are those instruments and how tight is that singer in their respective locations? When you set up your speakers in your room, you're trying to get the best overall trade-off that you can between lows to highs and then in respect to the soundstage aspect. Now, personally, I like a speaker that has a wider radiating profile because it tends to sound like it has a wider soundstage. That's, that's a me thing. You may find that in your room, you need a speaker that has a more narrow radiating profile. And when you mix these things all together, that's what gets you the imaging and the focus. I'm gonna talk about how the speaker selection drives those two aspects. But before I do that, I want to really help you understand what I mean when I say imaging, okay? So what I'm using here is a program called Isotope. And I have published these particular tracks or these sections of these tracks to my YouTube page, and I will make them available in the description section below. Isotope allows you to essentially visualize the instruments that are placed within the soundstage. This is the example that I gave you all last week and said, this is typically how you should strive to set up your speakers. If you take that information and apply it to what Isotope has in their sound field, then we can determine where is this image supposed to be placed in the sound field. So what we see right now is the standard screen that we get from Isotope. You have a hemisphere and then you have a couple pies cut out. These lines identify the left and the right boundary for this particular pie section right here. This particular section is the in phase section. And anything that is dead in the center right here would be something that is in pure mono. If the image shows that it's over here on the far left, that means it's hard panned left. And then if it's on here to the right, then it's hard panned right. Now, if you keep these left and right lines, and then you look at the bottom section of these pies, this is the area where the imaging is out of phase. So the mixer or producer is gonna take time and play around with some stuff and basically take the sound stage that you typically have in your stereo triangle and just blow it out. So no longer do you have sounds coming from the left, whoop, right, left, and then the right, but you also have them coming from like maybe even behind you sometimes. It's some weird stuff. As I said earlier, a lot of this stuff is baked into the recording. Now you can certainly play speakers at weird angles and do all that and try to get some of this stuff if you want to, but I think it's a waste of time. Just go with whatever is on the recording. And if you don't like the recording, maybe try to find a different version of it. There are all sorts of different masters. And I give this example a lot. Madonna's Immaculate Collection is a fine example of an album that was mixed and produced in what they call Q sound. It's all sorts of weird phase stuff. If you listen to any of her tracks from not the Immaculate Collection and then go listen to the same track on the Immaculate Collection, you're immediately gonna notice that the ones from the Immaculate Collection, which is like a greatest hits, images are all over the place. And there will be some tracks where it will literally sound like it's coming from behind you, even when you're listening in stereo, okay? But that's how they do it. They basically put the instruments and things of that nature out over here into the out of phase areas and then out over here to the out of phase areas on the right. What I'm gonna do is play a couple tracks to illustrate what I'm talking about here. The first track I'm gonna start off with is the Iaska seven snare or seven drum snare track from their competition CD. So if you've ever competed in car audio, you know this track very well. And if you have it, you should try to get a hold of it. This track will pan the snare from left to right in seven different beats. So pay attention to this particular area, okay? How did you hear that? What you should have heard is left to right. Let's go back. I'm gonna talk about this just a little bit, okay? So we got the initial left. This is how I set up systems and how I evaluate systems when I use this track. I sit back, I close my eyes, the left snare comes in, I point to where that sound is coming from, okay? Now, ideally it should be 
pretty small. It shouldn't be fat and huge. If it is really wide, then something's out of focus. The next track or the next snare comes up and it's left of center. Okay, see where that placement is? So it should be just a little bit to the right of that far left. And then the next one comes in, it's a little bit closer to the center. And then we get center come in. So close your eyes, point to the left one, point to the next one, point to the next one, and then point toward the center. Maybe you can't see my hand. So it's like this, 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 and this. As you do that, open your eyes and look where you're pointing. If you don't notice that there is some good separation between, especially the, the two in the middle, then something's off in your stereo. Now, this could be the speakers, this could be the room, or this could just be your setup. But at least now you have an understanding of, hey, something's off, or this stuff is doing what it's supposed to do. Good news. The next track is a another well-loved by the car audio community, Spanish Harlem by Rebecca Pigeon. Now, the reason that this track is mostly used is for the stand-up bass because it has a few different notes and they typically highlight some real resonance in the car audio community. Uh, car audio, man, it's just a different ball game. If you think home audio is hard, try car audio. Seriously, it's, it's a totally different ball game. But what I'm trying to display here is to show you when the singer is singing, she's in mono, but you're going to see some spanning out of the different instruments in this middle pie section, okay? That's the bass. There is a rose in Spanish Harlem. Now what you may notice if you play this enough and you pay attention to it, the bass comes in, the bass is dead center, okay? When Rebecca Pigeon comes in, you'll see a little bit more flare off to the right of center, just a smidge. Now that is the difference between a good system and a fantastic system in terms of imaging, but you also have to have focus because if you have two images that are pretty close to each other, if you don't have focus, they're gonna bleed over and you're not gonna know, well, really distinctly where one is or where one image is. As you continue to play this track, now catch how it went from right to left. I'm gonna do that again. That's her lighting up the room. You can hear a lot of ambiance in this track too. So there's a couple things that I like using this track for. The upright bass, her voice. If it's just a little bit right when it comes in, you know you're doing something right, no pun intended. And then just the overall ambiance. Are you getting that? Is it kind of panning and moving around in the room? Now, if the previous two tracks did not get me demonetized or maybe even copyright struck, this one 100% will. So. If you would like to support what I'm doing here, please consider joining my Patreon at patreon.com, buying some t-shirts or a hat or something from the description link below, or use any of my generic affiliate links that will take you to Amazon, Crutchville, Best Buy, Audio Advice, et cetera, et cetera. You can use those links, buy anything that you want, and it earns me a small commission. And that's how I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing. Okay, so now what I wanna play for you is one of my all-time favorite songs, and you're probably sick of hearing it if you're the audiophile type. It is Dire Straits, Money for Nothing. But what I want you to pay attention to in particular is when the electric guitar comes in, note how instead of being in this stereo triangle right here or in this pie, it spreads all over the place, okay? We're gonna do that. See that? And it just bounced it's all over the place. The reason I like this song and the reason I hate this song at the same time is when I first started in audio, I thought that I was supposed to be able to identify where that guitar was coming from. I thought it was between the left and the right somewhere, but it was never focused and I could not figure it out. I spent so much time listening and adjusting equalization and playing around with time alignment and crossovers and everything that I could throw at this thing to try to get that guitar to focus up and be somewhere. Like initially I thought it's supposed to be to the right or center. And then I was like, well, maybe it's to the left. I did not, I honest to God, did not know that there was that much phase manipulation as there is in this track until I used this program. And then when I used this program and saw 
all of that, I realized, holy crap, I've been chasing my tail for so long, it's not even funny. And that is another reason why I really encourage you people to understand what you're listening to. It's not just your speaker setup, and it's not just how much money you spend on cables and your room and acoustic treatment. The recording 100% matters. Imagine spending years trying to understand why you could not get something to line up, but every other track that I played, mono, Rebecca Pigeon, seven drum track, everything. But for some reason, that guitar would not sit still. Well, now I know why. And the cool thing about it is when you understand this, you can see that it's jumping out out of phase on the left. Listen for that. Listen how far out and not necessarily, you can't touch it, right? It's not in one specific position, but it's way out there and it's bouncing around on the left side. Now that you have a better understanding of what imaging means, I'm gonna nerd out on you a little bit and please don't roll your eyes. Please hang around because I promise this hopefully will be informational, okay? So the other aspect that I talked about besides imaging was focus. Now focus comes in a couple different ways. One easiest way to think about it is just pair matching between speakers. If you have speaker A and speaker B and they're from a pair, if they have the same response, then you're gonna get much more focus out of the speakers. And you're also gonna get imaging. So really all this stuff goes together, but I'm diving into the focus a little bit more here. If you have a speaker that is not quite pair matched, and let's say, for example, the crossover, it's different components, you know, quality of the parts, the tolerances is pretty low. You've got one speaker that has a response of, I don't know, maybe plus or minus three decibels. It's okay, it's not great. And then you've got the other one that's also plus or minus three decibels. But around that crossover region, the other one is maybe two decibels different at 3K or 2K or something like that. Well, when you're listening to speakers, you're gonna notice that the higher frequencies will tend to pull, or the higher mid frequencies, will tend to pull toward that speaker that has a little bit more emphasis in that particular region. That's not great, that's not even good. To get sharp imaging and good focus, you need pair matching. And you gotta pay up for that, unfortunately. Now, I will say that luckily, you can equalize speakers in a room to have good pair matching, but the speaker also has to have good directivity. And when I say good directivity, I essentially just mean that the speaker has to have the ability to have a very similar tonal balance off axis, off to the side of the speaker, as it does when it's pointed directly at you. And that's where anechoic measurements come in. We can measure these things, like how's the speaker perform when it's pointed at you, and how does it perform off to the side? Now, when a speaker has poor directivity, what you will find, and I've run into this so many times, it's not even funny, you will find that it's hard to identify where a specific instrument is. Now, we've already talked about imaging, so let's assume that you know where this instrument should be based on the recording. But let's say that you're listening to a track and you know that an instrument is supposed to be, let's say right center, just in between the right speaker and the center, phantom center, okay? You, it should be right in there. But when you're listening to it, maybe it sounds like it's in there for the mid range, but then the higher frequencies, it kind of, it jumps out. That is poor directivity. Basically, it means that whatever the speaker is radiating at lower frequencies, it's not doing the same at higher frequencies. Now, most speakers tend to narrow up as they get higher in frequency, meaning that they start off omnidirectional, so they send sound 360 degrees around the speaker. And then as they go from low to mid, they start to tighten up and it's more forward focused. And as they get into the high frequency, it's pretty much only forward focused, okay? Now that's that's the norm, really. That's the norm for a monopole type speaker. The issue comes into play when you have strong deviations even within an octave of each other. So let's say that you've got a crossover issue where the mid range at 800 Hertz is you know, pretty wide. And then at 1.6K, an octave up, it's narrow, and then you've got the tweeter coming in and the tweeter is really wide again. Now keep in mind that all this stuff is not just coming to your ear, but it's also going to the walls in your room and it's being reflected back to you. If the sound that is pointing directly at you does not totally match the sound that's reflected off the walls, then there's gonna be a total imbalance. But not only that, there's gonna be a shift in your sound stage. So if you have an instrument that has a fundamental of 800 Hertz, and then maybe it has a harmonic of 1.6, if it's really wide at 800 hertz, but narrow at 1.6K, then it's gonna sound over here, but then it's gonna sound over here. And then the same thing can be said for, let's take a piano, for example. There's a, there's a piano and it should be over here. Well, that piano covers a very wide range of frequencies. 
So at one particular frequency, that note may hit and it may be where it's supposed to be, right of center or in between. But at another key, you may find that it's in a different place. That's due to the radiation of the speaker. So I'm gonna give you a couple quick examples, okay? So here's the Paradigm Founder 40B. And this is the bird's eye view looking down on top of the speaker. This is the back of the speaker, this is the front, and these are the sides. And here's your legend right here, okay? The red is the higher SPL portion. And we can see that this speaker radiates at about plus or minus 40 degrees. If you go negative 40 here and positive 40 here in this red, that's pretty much where it is. But you'll also notice that it's not linear. There's not a, a straight line through here. It's not going this way or it's not coming straight down. It's kind of bouncing around. Now, this is a speaker that is going to sound a bit different in the room in regards to soundstage placement because of the wall reflections not matching the same intensity as the direct sound, at least in regards to relative balance. Kef speakers typically have a good directivity profile. And we can kind of see that here where we go through the red, it's just kind of narrowing up in the higher frequency, but it's not bouncing around a lot. Now, let me give you an example of a very egregious performer, the Klipsch Heresy 4. If we look at the red portion, we can see that this speaker's sound is bouncing all over the place at different frequencies. So it's very frequency dependent in relation to the sound radiation. So at this frequency, maybe it's only about 20 or 30 degrees wide. And then at this frequency, it's about 50 degrees wide. And then right here, it's about 20 or 30 degrees again. The problem with this speaker is it's got three different drivers. It's got the highs right here, the mid right here, and the low right here. Now the crossover between each of these guys is subpar. And if I remember correctly, the crossover between the mid and the high was really the worst offender. I think the mid bass and the mid was okay. But you can see that going on here. So you're going from the mid to the higher frequency. Now you're narrowing up. This is where that mid range comes in right here. Blows out, gets really wide, and then it starts to narrow up again. Here comes the high frequency, the tweeter, right here. The moral of the story is the speaker is radiating wide, narrow, wide, narrow, wide, and then narrow again. So all of the instruments that are found through this entire range of frequencies, they're gonna be placed at different points in the soundstage. Therefore, your imaging is going to be off and your focus is going to be messed up. If you like the speaker because it has great dynamic range, kudos to you. Every speaker is a trade-off. But at least now you can have an understanding of why I personally don't like the speaker. And that's due to its overall tonal balance and the fact that it does not image well at all. That ends my discussion about imaging and focus and the things that you really need to pay attention to if you're trying to achieve both. Hopefully you've got some good information here that you can use. And again, I'll remind you that if you wanna go check out these tracks and the imager, I have the link to these YouTube videos in the description section below. Feel free to pull those up and check them out at your leisure. If you have any questions, feel free to answer, ask, ask in the comments section below. And I'll try to answer, but most likely with my day job and everything else I've got going on, I probably won't be able to, but I'll try. I promise I'll try. And if you don't mind, please leave me a like and subscribe if you haven't already because that stuff helps me. I'm getting close to 100K and that would be really cool if I could get there soon because I want one of those plaques just so I can show my daughter. I won't hang it up behind me. But, you know, my 14-year-old daughter might think, oh, my dad's kind of cool because you know they're all about that social media stuff. Anyway, uh, I'll talk to you all later and I appreciate you watching. Truly, take care. Peace.